Okay, well, of sincere apologies to everybody that, um, that we've actually uh, not managed to get this live on Facebook, that it's actually going to be recorded. Um, but hopefully you'll uh, still appreciate and enjoy it. But any questions, then please direct them at Hayley uh, whilst we are sort of doing this recording or those afterwards can message underneath the recording um, and we will get back to you. But as you can see, for uh, those of you that are new to um, Hayley and myself, we are AREA, co-founded by myself and Hayley. We are the Aquatic Rehabilitation and Exercise Academy. And we, our main aim is to bring research-based education to anybody that wants to know it and understand it about uh, the aquatics. So as you can see along the bottom, we have got uh, partnerships with various companies. We are accredited by the YMCA and Simspa in the UK. We are training providers for them. And the AEA, which is the Aquatic Exercise Association in America. Um, so that we, you can also get points through um, them. Uh, you can also see that we've got 10 point, Simpsons points for some of our uh, courses that we run. Um, the Aqua Stretch course is worth 10 points for yeah. Simpsons. Uh, the Aquanatal course that Haley runs is a nine points. We did a conference last October and that is seven points for a two day conference, which is how many hours, Haley? was that? Sorry, Linda, say that again, please. How many hours is the uh, conference, the seven point? Oh, sorry, Linda, I've just muted you. Um, unmute yourself, sorry. I've just, I've just muted everyone, I've muted you as well. Um, so the um, since for points, if you attended any of our convention lectures in October, they are still online. And if you attend, um, if you if you do two of the lectures, then you get a one point five one and a half point Simspa points for two lectures. If you do a whole day's worth, which is the um, seven hour seven points, no sorry three and a half points. The seven points is if you do all of the weekend courses. The nine yep. points is for a aquanatal course, but that's under review because I've just redone the aquanatal course and that is a online course now and it's separated into natal and postnatal. So we've got a huge um, array of, of courses that are going to be linked with that coming up, but they're um, just going through the process of being accredited by Simspa. And then we have Linda's Aqua Stretch course, which is the 10 Sims per points. And that is also going to be going um, through the uh, online process to be able to do it part online, part live due to the fact of what's happening in today's climate. And then um, we have more courses coming off from that one. So back specialist, back care. And then Linda has Introduction to Aquatic Therapy, which is also an online course, which is going through the um, process of, again, the accreditation. And that takes up a bit of time. So our courses are going to be a lot more like learning, pre-learning online um, so that you're able to then do it at home at your own at your own pace, at your own um, leisure. And then being able to actually come and attend a day in practice is where we're going to then hopefully be able to have that once we once this COVID lockdown, everything's all lifted and we can then start interacting more into a, a personal one to one face to face type um, aspect. Um, and then that will then allow us to then have special days that will be specific for those courses. Thank you. You're stealing my time. <laughs> Okay, so that's that's sort of like the accreditation and what we're known for. But that's not what you're here for today. What you're here for today is the physiology of immersion. So I'm not going to go through the entire thing because, again, the entire thing is actually um, a workshop as well. And uh, that is going to be part of the introduction to aquatic therapy also being a standalone course. So this is just to give us an idea and for people because 
On, online, we've also got people who, um, are particip who participate in being in the water, not just actual instructors. So I think we've got a whole array of people are with us today. Swimming teachers, fitness, aqua fitness, as well as aqua therapy. Um, so hopefully I'm gonna sort of cover a little bit of everything that will be a bit of interest, um, plus having a little bit of a review on things that um, some of you will know, some of you won't. Okay, so let's start off with buoyancy. So Archimedes principle, um, when a, buoyant, a body weighs less than the fluid it displaces, it will float. So this is something that we're all very familiar with. Um, when we do our sort of initial courses, it's something that we sort of discuss and we talk about, but it's just understanding a little bit um, more about it. So we've also got to think about the different sizes of bodies. So when a body weighs more than the fluid it displaces, it will sink. So if you've got a person who is very muscle bound, then the chances are they are going to be more like a sinker. But how we place them as well in the water when we're actually looking at exercise or rehabilitation is going to be affected. So if you've got an athlete, you can take them into the deeper water and they're not going to float away. But like a lot of our ladies, especially when we talk about aquatic fitness, they like to keep warm. They like their shoulders under the water. So they tend to go down into the deeper water. The problem that that has is, of course, they're much more floaty. So the limbs are going to float more. And again, if you've got somebody who is going into the pool and they're going deeper because they like to be deep in the water, they think they can work harder, but they have a higher amount of adipose tissue, of fatness, then they're going to float as well. So if you could take those people into the deeper water, then they're not going to have control over their body. So we've got to think, when we're thinking about buoyancy, we've actually got to think about what we're actually trying to do and what we're trying to achieve with people. So as you can see by this picture here, um, we've got how, how if you're sort of working with cork, <laughs> not the people, there are many people that are made out of cork. If you're using a buoyant aid that's made out of cork, then it's going to want to float. So if you're sort of looking at um, using something that's light and things like the floats, things like the dumbbells and everything which are very buoyant, then they're going to want to be up on the surface of the water. So again with the exercise, if you're wanting to do something like a traditional bicycle where you've got the elbows tucked in the side and that lifting your arms up towards your shoulder, but you've got a dumbbell a float or something that floats uh, that's less than the fluid it displaces then you're not actually going to be using those muscles in the same way so you're going to be using it more in extension because as you pull it down from the surface of the water it's going to be a lot harder so you're actually going to be working on the triceps as opposed to the biceps okay the same with equipment that if you put it on the lower limbs if you use equipment and you use uh, the buoyant cuffs or something like that around the ankles, then they're going to want to float up. So if you lift the legs up to the front, if you kick the legs up to the front, then it's going to be buoyancy assisted and it's going to be easier, which is great if you're looking for range of movement, but not so great if you're looking for strength of the quadriceps. The effort is going to be on the pulling down. Okay, so we need to think about things like that when we're thinking about buoyancy. Are, have we got something that weighs less than the fluid it displaces? Or are we using equipment that weighs, weighs more than the fluid it displaces? Is it drag equipment? Okay, so just having a little think about that makes us start to think about the buoyancy and how we're going to use it and how it's going to affect us. So I love these two, these pictures, because these are two of my girls, not Hayley, luckily, she'll be very pleased to know, I think it's her sisters, not her. But, um, you know, similar pose for both of them. And then th all things weigh the same, will not displace the, sa displace the same amount of water. So back to that sort of floating to that cork. So as you saw that in the previous picture, let me just go back if I can. We have the same size ball here. So where my little cursor is. 
So the cork is the same size as the wood, is the same size as iron, and is the same size as the watermelon. But each of them are floating at different points. So if we think about that, then the, the same thing is not going to float in the same in the same depth of the water. Okay, so it's the sort of density then of that object that is going to be uh, have an effect on us. So we we need to take that into account. Not all things are equal. And then the pressure of the water that is exerted on the body is going to be equal pushing in, but the depth is going to make it different. So here again, we have a, a, a change, something different to think about. So the pressure from the, from the water that pushes down on the body is the amount of gravity. So the amount of gravity that we have pushing down on our head and possibly our shoulders if they're out of the, of the water is going to hold us down and is going to be equal. But the pressure that comes up Okay, is going to is going to create a, a a different effect on the body. Okay, so the deeper that we go into the water, the the more pressure there is, and this is hydrostatic pressure, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So it changes, but we have this equal amount of force that's happening, and what happens is when we are um, going into the pool. So as you can see from this picture, uh, ankle deep water. So as we go in, the pressure that takes hold of the foot and takes hold of the ankle is going to have an effect immediately. It's going to have an effect on the vascular system, on the heart, and also on the, um, on the fluid within the body. So you, you then also start to offload the weight of gravity. OK, so you go into water, you have a pressure going on. You're instantly affecting the heart, the vascular system, the fluid system, plus the amount of gravity that is being loaded onto the, onto the body and onto the joints. Come up to the thigh, it's 35 percent of gravity that is reduced. Up to the waist, you've got 50 percent, the chest, 70 percent, and up to neck deep, you have 90 percent. So each time you go in, you're having this pressure you're affecting the blood pressure, you're affecting the heart response, you're affecting the fluids that are within the tissue, and you're affecting the amount of gravity and offloading the weight that goes through the body. So if you have a person who has um, recently had surgery and they've had, let's say, a knee replacement, so to start with, they're, they come into the pool and what you want them to do is you want them to offload their weight because they're coming in probably with two crutches. So they're non sort of weight bearing on that leg. So you can take them around chest deep water. So 75% to 90% or chest deep or neck deep water, 75 to 90% of the, your gravity is and weight of the body is offloaded by the, the water. Plus you're going to have that pressure going onto all the sides of the body. And that is going to affect that fluid retention. So where they've had the surgery and we get filled up with fluid when we're having a surgical procedure, it's going to help to redistribute that. Okay. So then as you, you get better and they maybe go from walking around with two crutches, one crutch, you can go from between 50 to 75% weight bearing. So they're then partial weight bearing. But there they can learn how to sort of, again, walk properly, to increase the, the gait size, to increase their stride length, um, to walk without having to limp, because once we have a limp, we have to unlearn a limp. Um, and they can actually start to increase their strength and increase and improve their range of movement. So again, buoyancy has lots of positive effects for people when they are working in therapy. So here's some of the advantages. So you're going to decrease the impact on the joints with buoyancy. You're going to decrease the compression within the joints, because again, if you think about it, if you have someone who has arthritic joints, and let's face it, a lot of people who come to the pool, especially exercise, 
whether it be for therapy or just for aquatic fitness, a lot of them are generally uh, suffering from arthritis. It's the kind of demographic and population that we have. So you're going to decrease that even by a sort of millimeter. Instead of being maybe bone rubbing on bone, you're just going to give a little bit of joint spacing. And what happens with that joint spacing is instead of creating inflammation and aggravation within that joint and within that arthritic area, it's actually going to allow the, the synovial fluids and the plasmas to actually um, to, to decompress and to actually decrease um, pain and sensitivity. So going into the pool, again, it depends on what depth they're going in, thinking about the previous slide, we're gonna, the deeper it is, the more decompression you're gonna get on the joints, okay? The other thing that happens is it can also help to decrease the fear of falling. It's like a liquid Zimmer frame. You're not going to, the worst that's gonna happen is the hair will get wet and possibly if they're wearing makeup, the makeup will smudge. But other than that, you're actually not gonna really hurt yourself if you fall. Or of course, if they're frightened of water, then there's, they might be a little bit scared, but they're still not gonna get injured. So it helps to decrease the fear of falling. People who are um, in pain, unstable, have neurological conditions, the buoyancy of the water helps them to actually um, be able to sort of stand and stabilize and helps with balance and all the other sort of benefits that we have to, uh, to, being, to using the buoyancy and using the water. It decreases the stress of the connective tissues as well. So the connective tissues and especially things like fascia are very hydrated. They, they, are, um, they are full of plasma and full of uh, all the sort of lubricating fluids that the, the human body needs. So what we, are, um, we do is by being in the pool, it helps and it acts sort of like a pump. And the lymphatic system, which is a hydrating system of the body, and it's our uh, immune system as well, it's, it's part of the immune system. What being in the pool and what the buoyancy and the hydrostatic pressure do is they actually sort of act like a pump because unlike the vascular system, which has the heart, the lymphatic system and connective tissue depend upon muscle and movement to actually um, create that sort of that pumping effect. It also helps to support the weaker muscles. So if you have uh, somebody who's in a wheelchair, sometimes you can find that actually by taking them into the pool, they, they can stand on their two legs. And there's nothing more joyous than seeing a person who spends all of their day in a wheelchair actually being able to walk when they're in the water. Um, I've had a lot of people that sort of do actually end up crying because they sort of remember what it's like to be able to do that. And it's excellent for, again, making the muscles move, making that lymphatic system move to actually get things to be lubricated again and to work on their posture. And a person does not necessarily even have to move to see the benefits, even just by standing still, all those positive effects can happen. OK, so they, it really, really can help. So some of the disadvantage of buoyancy, though, is that it can create an unstable environment. So if you've got somebody who is um, very unstable on their feet, then the pressure or very weak, then the pressure of the water moving just even in a pool can make them a little bit unsteady. So it can make them a little bit nervous if they're not used to that. And so understanding about buoyancy, understanding about the properties of water, understanding the sort of um, effects it can have on the human body gives us uh, the power to, to explain to clients and to um, make them understand or help them to understand and help them to actually appreciate the, uh, the sort of positive benefits that they can have from being in the pool. Also for the weak and paralyzed extremities, it can be a little bit of an, uh, a disadvantage until maybe your clients understand what this can do for them. Because if you've got somebody who is um, very uh, high, has a lot of hypertone within the muscles, 
has a lot of um, imbalances between the sides of their body. Uh, maybe you could even have an amputee. Um, and what they'll find is that the buoyancy of the water and the metacenter of the body become uh, imbalanced. And they have, you have to learn how to actually create that balance. So if you've got somebody who's maybe hyper got hypertonicity on one side of the body, you might want to actually put an armband or something on the arm that will help for that side to float. Whereas, you know, the other side is, has normal mobility, normal ability, um, and, and that can float generally much better. Uh, so it's, again, if you've got somebody who maybe has, uh, is an amputee or something, um, then you can also have them that you might find that diagonally opposite. So let's say they have an amputee, amputated leg uh, above the knee amputation on the a leg, on maybe the right leg, I'm rubbing my leg, you can't see that, so on <laughs> the right leg, then you might find that you actually want to put a float onto the left arm to counterbalance. Because quite often, if you've got somebody who uh, even used to be a swimmer or wants to learn to swim and they're a new amputee, then they're going to be very unbalanced in the water. You know, the buoyancy is going to be affected quite significantly. So you need to find a counterbalance for that. So there, that's sort of some of the disadvantages, but can be overcome just with a little bit of deeper understanding. So considerations uh, is again, the stability aspect for the practitioner and for the, th the client. So that on, as a practitioner, as a therapist, then maybe you've got to sit there and think, okay, I, I can't go too deep because I won't have control over my body because of the buoyancy of the water, which means I won't have control and I won't be able to assist the person that I'm working with. Okay, uh, the flaccid extremities, I've already explained about that really within the disadvantages, they may float or sink. And the other thing that you get, and um, this is very common, is toe walking. Because of the buoyancy of the water lifting everything up, everybody up, people tend to go into the pool and tend to end up staying on their toes. So what we need to encourage again is for people to put their feet down. We don't walk around the street on our tiptoes, or maybe if you're wearing your high heels. But other than that, you know, we want to encourage them to put their, their feet down. So just sort of like have a look into the water, see what people are doing and just you know, remember some of those aspects as well. So we're gonna move then on to hydrostatic pressure. So it goes really with buoyancy and that's why I chose these two to be the main ones that I was gonna focus on tonight. Um, so we live in a very um, small area of acceptance on this planet. We, we tend to live around sea level, most of us. Most of the planet lives around sea level. Uh, if we go and climb a mountain, then quite often we can have issues with the equilibrium and the pressure and the ambient pressures. But also, if we go diving into the sea, equally the same thing. So we tend to have our, the best capacity for living life around sea level. But if we go into the sea and for every 33 feet a diver descends, the weight of the water on top of them increases by 15 pounds per square inch, which is quite a lot. So you hear of sometimes divers that go down too deep and if they don't uh, repressurize gradually as they come up, they get something called the bends where there's just too much oxygen getting in too quickly into the body and uh, can cause some horrendous uh, issues really to us. Um, unfortunately, death being one of them as well. But um, even just within a small area of going into the water, we are going to have an effect on the body. And you can see again by this diagram, similar to the last diagram, we have that unloading of the buoyancy, but you can see by the arrows on the right hand side down here, that actually the deeper into the water we go, the more pressure is exerted on the body. So it is equal in the amount of the contact, but the actual pressure within our sort of fluid systems of the body 
is actually going to change in the deeper into water we go. So the advantage or one of the advantages of that is, of course, that if you suffer from edema, then you're going to sort of come out and you're going to have, um, the edema is going to be much, much less to when, to when you went in. But unfortunately, because we live on gravity within about two, year, two, two years, two hours, it's all going to come back. Um, and we'll be back to where we were. But in the meantime, there's been a lot of nutrient replacements. There's been a, a lot of things happening within the body that's been of a massive benefit. So the other thing is it's also gonna make, um, have an effect on our muscles and it's also gonna have an effect on our lungs. So it's, the lungs are gonna have to work harder when we go into the water. So it's a really good um, property of water to actually assist with edema, fluid transfer within the body, to assist with breathing, okay? One of these sort of light issues is possibly if you actually have a broken rib, then that's not gonna to be too good, but generally it's very good for training, it's very good for controlling uh, mild asthma. You can quite often find that people uh, sort of learn to swim to help control and regulate the asthma and to actually be able to control the breathing. It helps um, with people who have COPD as well. So the movement of the fluid across all the capillaries is going to be affected by the hydrostatic pressure. So the oxygen and carbon dioxide change between the body cells uh, is going to be more prolific through being in water than it is um, in our everyday environment and on land. So I like this picture as well. This is sort of like one of the newer pictures that I've, I've had. And this one is showing that actually things do change from being static in water to moving in water. So you can see from here that actually, whereas when you stand and all the research or most of the research is done with standing static in water, so if you get sort of the journals out, you know, the ASIS, which is the anterior superior iliac spine. So the uh, top of your hip bones um, is 50, you're offloading the gravity by 50%. Whereas actually, if you're moving faster, it moves up to more like waist, waistline. Okay, so the, the faster you move in water, actually it's gonna change the amount of offloading and weight bearing that we have. Okay. So some of the advantages of hydrostatic pressure. So we, again, we have increased cardiac efficiency. Um, so that the heart rate is going to um, have to deal with within the first six seconds of going into the water, you have an extra 750 milliliters of blood that passes through the heart but it actually only takes about six seconds for the heart to deal with this. So one of the issues that you have to think about is if you've got somebody who's had heart surgery or is recovering from heart surgery or heart attack, then you need to make sure that they have got GP clearance to go into the pool because they do need to be at least level four before they can come into the pool because of that initial 750 milliliters of um, blood that, that gets pumped through in the first six seconds. So it's, but it's very, very good on, for people who have edema for or any kind of swelling. So that post-surgery or, sorry, excuse me, post-exercise or post-injury or for somebody who has lymphedema. So if you've got uh, clients coming into the pool who have lymphedema or lipedema, then you need to take into account the buoyancy aspect as well. So though it's great for the compression aspect, the buoyancy, they don't need to be too deep or otherwise they won't have the right sort of control over their limbs. Everything's just want to float, gonna float about. And as an interesting um, sort of point to this as well, when I was reading up uh, about some of the things on the hydrostatic pressure, I did see a comparison between the compression stockings, so the, the TED stockings, which is the thumbo em, embryo, embryo thumb, thrombo <laughs> embryo stockings, that's TED, um, 
and they only compress to 20 millimeters of mercury. Whereas actually just being one meter deep in the water, the pressure of the water against the legs is actually 72.4 millimeters. So you, you've already got a better compression from being in the swimming pool than you actually get out your compression stockings. Unfortunately, we can't live in that environment, but this is why a lot of the people, and a lot of people I see that have got lymphedema, say that they benefit so much from being in the pool and that they've got more mobility and uh, when they come out of the pool. And that's because of that increase in pressure that they get from the, the water as opposed to the stockings. So I think, you know, that in itself makes hydrostatic pressure an amazing um, physiological effect on, on the human body because the lymphedema, the edema, the swellings that we get can be so debilitating. And it's one of the things, again, with having this lockdown that my client said when, when we could get back in the pool last summer for a couple of months, how much they'd missed it and, and how different and how much heavier their legs had felt. And, you know, that they realized that actually they needed the pool for more reasons than one. Okay. Um, so uh, it's helped, it stretches on the myocardium. So again, through being in the pool, back to the heart, it's going to actually give the heart the effect of heavy exercise without actually increasing its um, beats per minute. So you'll be able to exercise for longer duration than a lot of people can do on land. So you get that sort of same physiological adaptation to exercise in the pool that you would do for working a lot longer on land. Okay, um, increases the stroke volume and increases the height of the diaphragm. So what's gonna happen is that the diaphragm is actually going to raise higher into the chest cavity than it does. We need to actually be able to breathe against it. So you're gonna decrease the lung volume, but you're actually gonna to have to work harder at training the, um, the respiratory muscles more in the pool than you do on land, okay? Um, so yes, I think I've explained all of that. So some of the benefits, some of the precautions for this one. So we're gonna decrease the pain and edema, uh, very good for this, the, the nerve muscle, the, the sensory, the pain, pain receptor muscles. Increase the range of movement because we are decreasing inflammation and swelling within joints because the buoyancy is gonna help with the range of movement and the flexibility. So we're gonna have an increase in all of that. It's gonna to help to increase the venous return. So the blood does not have to, because of that hydrostatic pressure and buoyancy, the, the blood is assisted back to the heart. So it's gonna increase venous return. And then it's gonna increase the intercostal muscle strength. So we have to sort of work that much harder. And we only really sort of tune into that as much with things like Pilates. So you can actually um, encourage people to breathe more deeply and they get a lot more proprioceptive input because of the tactile facilities of the water as well. So it therefore allows for harder training with less strain on the cardiovascular system, one I'm always in favor of. Assists in learning the diaphragmatic breathing. So again, if you've got somebody with COPD or somebody with asthma, or people who um, have sort of like have breathing issues that, and that need to actually relearn and reconnect with breathing patterns, which um, is something that they reckon is going to be quite important when we come out of this lockdown that everybody learns to breathe again more naturally because of the stress related aspect of, of lockdown and things like that. Um, so combined with aerobic training, it helps to increase the lymphatic flow. So we still will get an element of lymphatic drainage because of the hydrostatic pressure, uh, creating that um, pressure on all the fluid systems, on the vascular system and on the oncotics. But also because it hasn't got the pump, we do 
benefit and we need really to move the muscles as well to actually help to create that sort of pumping effect through that lymphatic system. It improves muscle balance because the resistance is 360 degrees around the body and it dampens the involuntary movement of things like Parkinson's and cerebral palsy. So people that have, um, get the shakes and things like that, it actually helps to suppress and dampen that down. So precautions, it can cause unstable blood pressure. Now I always sort of say one of the, the issues with that is if you don't know you've got unstable blood pressure, then you're not gonna necessarily know the results. And it's the same with low blood pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is very good for helping training people who have high blood pressure, but not so good if you've got low blood pressure, because if it's gonna help reduce the blood pressure and you've already got low blood pressure, it can create some issues. So what we want to do is um, if we've got somebody who has uh, low blood pressure, we want to make sure that we keep an eye on them or that we get them to be uh, referred by their GPs. It can cause tactile defensiveness of the sensory system because again, if somebody's got, um, they're highly sensitive or have the, um, uh, I can't think what it is, the, um, ah, CPS. whatever it is, pain syndrome. The word is just, sorry, that's my dyslexic moment. It will come to me. So if you have a heightened uh, sensitivity and heightened uh, neuro neural system, then you can get a little bit of tactile defensiveness. But if you get somebody to come slowly into the pool, um, maybe come in and just sort of take your time, either sort of sitting on the side with their feet just in the water, um, then gradually going down so that if they've got the sort of graduated steps much nicer or like where I work, I've got a wheelchair ramp, you can take them in slowly or you can just have them in the pool and just have them sitting there for a mo for a little while and gradually help them to and, and talk to them, explain about how things are, what things are happening within their body. We can sort of help to try and overcome that. But it's something that we do need to be aware of if we're working with people with um, neurological conditions. And it can overload the cardiovascular and pulmonary system for those with cardiac issues as well. So we do need to sort of be aware, be cautious, make sure we work within our own limits that we actually are only sort of like helping people that we are licensed and insured to, to work with, okay. So some considerations that you can have people that have difficulty moving. For some people, that resistance of the water can still be too much. So you could have somebody that comes in that maybe has been on bed rest. Or look at the fact that we've got all these people that are gonna be coming to us who've had COVID, that have been in bed rest for, could be for a, a long, long time. Then their muscles are gonna be very weak. So maybe we want to start with them in a horizontal position as opposed to in being in a vertical position and get them to increase their sort of their strength gradually. OK, we can do things like Badragar. We can do things like Halliwick. There's 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 techniques that we can learn and we can use for people that might have a lot of difficulty in moving. Alternatively, we could be sort of sitting perhaps on a step and gradually work that. So we can gradually take people deeper into the water. We can use that buoyancy to our advantage um, and we can also use it to help with strengthening. So the tactile defensiveness, we need to be cautious of. And then the vestibular is easy to overstress. So we, we need to sort of take that into account as well. So just looking at some of the physiology, I hope that you can sort of see this slide. There's a lot of words on it. Um, <laughs> I'll have to put my glasses on to actually read some of it for you. So before immersion and during immersion. So at neck level, we've got more venous compression, which I've already spoken to you about. The heart size increases by 30% and the, the rate it pumps slows by about 20%. So, you know, there's quite a lot of physiological changes that happen um, to the heart and everything. 
The heart pumps more blood, the chest wall is compressed. I've already spoken about all of those. The pleural pressure increases. So you've got to be careful that, you know, anybody that may have had pneumonia, then you want them to be sort of in the shallower water first and only gradually after a few weeks sort of take them as they uh, recondition into the deeper water. You don't want them to go initially chest deep or neck deep in the water because that pleural pressure can be far, far too much for them initially. The lungs will contain more blood and the body works harder to move than it does uh, in the air. So it works, um, there's more blood is distributed to the kidneys and brain. So there's lots of things that are gonna go on there, which uh, I will speak about in a moment. So the diaphragm, as I said, is elevated uh, and it comes higher during inspiration and expiration. So we cannot actually, you know, without training, use our lungs in the same capacity. So those that maybe are, have got um, respiratory issues then that can be a little bit disconcerting for them initially. So maybe we want to sort of, again, explain to them what's happening, explain about the hydrostatic pressure, about the buoyancy of water, that it's going to make that diaphragm lift within to the chest cavity and that, you know, you can then sort of calm them down and help to educate them on breathing uh, into, into the rib cage and everything. At the umbilical level, as the water level rises, the abdomen is compressed and more blood is forced upward into the chest cavity and the pelvis vessels um, compress compression occurs as well. So you're going to get that compression in there. And of course, we know what happens then is that it will go into the kidneys. So at knee level, we've got the venous and lymphatic compression, uh, which begins progressively and pushes the blood upwards. So I, I quite like that. That's, an, that's a new... Um, image that I have had for this, which I think is really good. So looking at the sensory aspect of things, that's going to um, have an increased output. So we're going to get more body awareness. So the, the, high, the hydrostatic pressure is going to give us a, a higher proprioceptive input and therefore be more aware of where our body is and how we can move about and uh, postural realignment because it's going to be um, you'll feel any differences a lot more in the water than you do on land. One of the things I like doing and I don't know if Haley's actually put it up online was that I made her go into the deep water do a cross-country movement so it's just her and her muscles to see whether it was balanced and we did a thing where we you know, she's pretty balanced. She's been a water baby all of her life, um, like it or not really, you know, when, when I'm her mum. But then we sort of did it where I said to her, okay, only really use one leg. And she sort of turned around and round. So it's a good way of assessing whether people are skeletally balanced um, and mus muscularly balanced rather than skeletal. I don't, I don't, I haven't put that up, but I have made a note to make sure I find the video and put it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, it increases the development of muscle learning and also can help improve oral skills, uh, for example, when blowing bubbles and hope, oh look, I'm trying to move my table here, hope, ooh, hopefully I can get this to play, hang on, I just need to move that out in the way, okay, oh, it, it, oh you can't see it. Now that's really weird because that was working a moment ago. Maybe it's going to start. Maybe it's not. So I think let's... our technical issues have just, you know, tonight. <laughs> Tonight's the night <laughs> we played, but it's I've got my little thingy whirring, so maybe it will just start up. But the picture here is of a young man that I work with. He's got uh, muscular dystrophy, bless his heart, and he's blowing. So. For him, it's trying to maintain the, I, I can't improve his muscle function. But I can try and maintain and prolong the use of his limbs as much as I can. And to also help to keep his lung capacity as good as we can. So we, we do a lot of games. We play our, a version of tennis um, using a pool paddle and a ball. And we do this blowing of the egg flips 
um, var various different sort of games. He's only a young lad, so it's more about trying to keep it sort of entertaining and fun as well as being part of his physiotherapy. So we can also help to increase posture and balance and especially for people who perhaps had a stroke or again Parkinson's. Uh, I work with some people who with motor neurons disease as well. So we have all, um, all of these things that actually by being in the pool can be very, very beneficial. And then just this little quote that I really like, which is from um, Vargas. It's from a book that I have, uh, Aquatic Therapy and Interventions. And it said, he says, facilitation or inhibition of motor function depends upon the appropriate implementation, implementation of the properties of water. So it's just, again, reiterating how vitally important it is for us to understand about the properties of water and, and the effect that it does have on the human body. On to the next bit. So the heart rate, as I explained, is going to be changed. So we're going to have a decrease of 15 to 32, to 15 percent at 32 degrees. So the research that I read is all related to a temp pool temperature of 32 degrees, which I know is warmer than uh, a lot of the pools, especially here in the UK. Um, but it was that or cold water. And I know that we don't have any pools at 20 degrees. So I thought, you know, this would be the closest that I could get in the research related articles um, at, the, at the time. So the right atrium, the cardiovascular pressure increases from three to 15 millimeters of mercury at that temperature and at that depth. So you've got an increase in the stroke volume of from 71 millimeters, milliliters per beat to 100 milliliters per beat. So you've got a, a you know quite a substantial increase in stroke volume uh, at that sort of temperature, and an increase in cardiac output of between 35 and 50 percent, and a decrease in the eject ejection fraction. So here we sort of saying that there's a decrease in the systolic pressure by 11% and a decrease in diastolic by 12% at that 32 degrees. But at that temperature, you've got zero change in the rectal temperature. So your core temperature doesn't change at all. Considering the fact that most hydro pools are sort of 35 to 36, it's interesting to see that at 32 degrees, you're not going to get a, um, a core temperature change. And this was after two hours as well, this paper said, and a zero um, change in metabolic temperature. OK, so I thought that was all quite interesting as well. So the kidneys, we've got a hundred and seven percent increase at that temperature. But generally, uh, after two hours, we have an increase in potassium excretion. So you need to make sure that um, you're eating your bananas. <laughs> That's one good thing that we uh, that we can enjoy, and an increased efficiency within your kidneys of between two hundred and three hundred percent over a two-hour period. So those of you that are swimming teachers that spend time in the pool, those people that are sort of like club swimmers, those people that spend time in the pool, even if you spend, you know, if you half that and spend an hour in the pool swimming your lengths and everything. No wonder most people, when they get out, the first thing they want to do is to go to the toilet. It's really hardly surprising, is it, when, the, when we've got that sort of thing going on? Oh, and there we go. So that's it. Look at that, half past eight. Perfect timing. Um, I know we were a little bit late in starting, but the idea was that I left some time for questions. So let me just come out of this. Feel free to unmute yourself if you yes. have any questions. We'll look forward to hearing them. Um, while you're just gathering yourself together, I would like to apologise if anyone had any of those um, links, dodgy links that I was trying to crazily keep up with as they were happening. Um, so if you do know of anyone that was wanting to attend tonight, or someone that was specifically going to be watching it via Facebook Live, 
then sincerely apologize to them for us, explain the situation. This was recorded, so I will be trying to get that up as soon as possible because I've got lots of people interested in coming, but obviously I haven't been able to um, get them there. So apologies. And if anyone has any questions for Linda. <laughs> You have to unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself, everybody. Or unmute yourself if you've got a question. We've got some that are just saying how interesting it was, Linda, um, and how lovely they, uh, they found all the details. Um, someone's asked if they can see the reference screen again. And um, yes. Um, and obviously if we are recording it then you can watch it again and see the references and pause it on that as well. Um, very interested in what they said on what they've said. I've lost the chat now because you um, sorry. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, yeah. Hi, it's Fiona Myers here from Kerno Hydro down in Cornwall. How are you doing? Hello. Hi. So I run a, a hydrotherapy centre down here for specifically um rehabilitation. Um yeah. I, I deal a lot with end of life care with small children um, to adults um, and I have a lot of issue with carers coming in um, that have absolutely no clue about what to do with the people that come in um, and I'm looking at writing something or putting something together for them to be able to do so they feel more competent and that I feel able to leave them alone <laughs> and not worry that you know last week seven-year-old boy in with a carer who's seen him five times and I kid you not I was drenched by the end of the session and I'm not supposed to even touch him but the amount of times that boy head bounced around and he was under the water because this guy just had no clue about how to support him and what to do. Oh uh, yes I hear that a lot and I see that a lot as well in the pool I work at it's quite scary isn't it? It's really quite scary so looking at, at what what you've got together gives people a bit of an understanding of the aquatic principles and awareness, um, which the STA is what uh, has quite a few qualifications through with water fitness. Um, so what's the difference between what you're doing and what, what's already available within the STA? Uh, I haven't actually seen the STA, um, what they're offering. Mm -hmm. um, the, syllabus, the syllabus that they've got yeah the syllabus that they're offering i mean this right. is just you know this is that was just a part of Ooh. the lecture um that i sort of that i deliver um well partly at university and that we're mm -hmm. using as our introduction to aquatic therapy oh um, brilliant so for physiotherapists for hydrotherapists for yeah and it would be a point system, would it be, that they would get X amount of points per module they did with you to then be Absol qualified? Absolutely. With? Yeah. What we're doing is we, they'll get X amount of points. Mm -hmm. um, we are actually talking with Swim England as well uh, about everything. But we are, we're going to, we're in negotiations to actually make it that they, they can go down a certain pathway with us. And once they've got, X amount of, of points or accreditations or courses that they've done that mm. they can actually end up with a diploma. So we want it to sort of be be something that will could be uh, mapped out across like a, a foundation degree um, for aquatic because there's nothing in the UK that will actually give somebody an overall you know qualification career path. Really, mm, have a look at the um, um, the there's a physiotherapist, chartered physiotherapists, um, and they have a hydrotherapy section. Yeah, yeah. we're linked yeah. with them. The ATACP. Yeah, there we go. ATACP. Yeah. yeah, we're linked I, with them as well. I did a lecture for them last year at their annual conference. Mm, okay. Was, you know, quite in touch with um, well, Sarah, Jackie, and Ollie. Yeah. Sort of, you okay. know, Water Fitness UK too. They're the ones that are linked with the STA, so they're yes. Probably the, the so we're fr we're friends with Ryan and, and Natalia, oh, um, yeah. and we've we've known Water Fitness for since it started back with Lynn Hickey back in the day. Oh yeah, that was years back. Yeah, yeah. It'd be nice so, to bring it all in together 
yeah. and I'm a bit of a, an intellectual snob. So <laughs> I, uh, for me, I get totally fucked off when people just have no idea about what they really ought to be doing to support the customers and the clients and the patients. Um, so for me, the, the, the more levels that you can put on, the better to make sure that we've actually got people that are going to be supporting the patient's needs. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, what we've what we're trying to do. So um, we come from if anyone doesn't know us from any from just, you know, we just turned up type thing. We were actually the um, presenters and lecturers for Steph at Hydroactive. We oh. can definitely say that we've been doing this for a long time. Linda, 25 mm -hmm. years and uh, no more than 25 years because I'm on 20 years. So um with the fact of what you're saying about courses for carers we have actually started speaking to someone about creating a course for carers and um we have lots of um progressions that we're doing where we're we're starting off with you know the the basic aqua course and building up so that you can then um then link it up with the universities that are then studying rehabilitation so there's this bridge of where we're going with it and yeah. how we're trying to link everything up and well, how we feel free do... to give me a shout yeah we'll get in touch with us because yeah. um yeah we're definitely we're um we're definitely pushing those boundaries between you know what's kind of just been the fitness and then it's just been the the therapists mm. and we're we're merging the two yeah and then on the other side, the carer, that's just that little bit more. I don't know about you guys, but owning my own center, I don't need a lifeguard there. A carer can come in, but that doesn't remove my liability as far as I'm concerned. My duty of care is to make sure that that patient's taken care of. Yeah, so it's... <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I would like to have a course, especially for carers, because where I work, we have just so many carers come in from care homes and everything into the pool and mm. they don't have any training and, th and they admit it they, they that they have no idea and they they just don't understand so you know for some that, of them can't even swim either no, oh, yes, i've had i've had right. some some that are all uh yeah can't swim can't can't do anything i mean I, there's one of them they nearly drowned it was just horrendous i had to i had to say to the client i was with do you mind if i just disappear a second i've just got to go and rescue but yeah bless him he he didn't have a clue how to handle the client so well that's really exciting to think that that next level is then a possibility oh um, yeah yeah brilliant yeah, yeah definitely link up with us fiona because then you know we we'll we'll show you know we'll give you the the guides of what we're getting up to you can then mm. keep an eye on what we're doing but yeah we're yeah. um which no we're, need to reinvent the wheel we may as well put all our heads together we've all got different ideas of, of what's what um yeah i'm just going through all the messages thanks kate as usual <laughs> and it is complex pain syndrome thank you yes i couldn't get the complex i was thinking chronic cr chronic kept coming into my head complex pain syndrome when people have that, then the, the water feels painful to them. In fact, clothes feel painful to them. So, um, yes. Thank you, Kate. Can I drag you back to like you're almost where you start in the beginning, Linda? Um, yes. Because you talked a bit about kind of how we might see people who've had um, COVID and kind of the whole impact on, on kind of the lungs in water. But one of the other things that kind of, I guess, we're quite almost notorious for in the UK is obesity. Um, yes. And when you started talking about kind of buoyancy and hydrostatic pressure, I wondered if you'd just talk a little bit about what difference it makes kind of where people are obese or where they kind of carry fat. Would you maybe just share a couple of thoughts on that for us? Because it's something I guess increasingly you've got Boris Johnson saying, let's all get fit, let's lose some weight, let's stop being fat. So it's yeah, going to bring people I, to us. You know what, the thing that I've noticed, and especially since lockdown, is most people talk about fitness from a fit point of view. They don't actually talk, you know, it's all well and good, like, you know, couch to 5K. I'll give you an example of that. I was seeing a client the other day. I'm not in the pool. I am on land at the moment and I am licensed to still treat. Uh, luckily enough, that's one thing that my degree has given me. But she was saying 
that she started off and it was something like a, a minute's walk and then 30 seconds run and then and then a minute's walk for, and so on and so forth and then she said that the next stage up was a minute's walk and a minute's run and I said but that's a hundred percent increase if you haven't walked anywhere that's massive you know if you haven't sort of done anything that is a huge proportion you've got to sort of take it in slow increments so I think you know it is it's a it's a massive thing to actually change from talking about fitness in people that are and most of fitness is again aimed at sort of probably between the well you've got Joe Wicks who's doing the children at the moment but otherwise it's sort of the the 20 to 40 possibly 50 stage but as you you know you're getting older and things are slowing down anyway once you sort of like stop doing the exercise it does take long so where you've got people um with the uh, sort of maybe obese then you want to take them in the pool but you don't want them to be out of control so it's going to depend upon the density and the size of the person again if you are sort of like um let's say obese because that's where people get classified but they are not obese with the lymphatic issues so you see a lot of people uh you know uh, maybe sort of oh you know look at that fat person look at that obese person but lymphedema, lipedema are very, very different. And they're actually really floaty. So they might be the size, and it's back to that density aspect. It might, they might be the same size as a person who is obese through um, overeating. Let's put it that way. I'm trying to be sort of subtle here a little bit. So please don't, don't shoot the messenger. But uh, if you've got- on, be honest. <laughs> <laughs> But so if you've got somebody who is obese through overeating, then they might be able to go deeper into the pool because what you want them to do is to offload the joints because it's the weight on the joints that gives them an issue. Now, I always remember, and every year that I say this, it does make me realize I'm a year older. But <laughs> donkeys years ago, I think now, they did a, a program called Celebrity Fat Club. Hands up if you remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple. <laughs> okay, so on Celebrity Fat Club, they had Rick Waller. And Rick Waller was huge. And he moaned and groaned and complained. And he actually left before the end of it. But the guy that was, oh, I can't remember who the presenter was and the, the fitness trainer was, but he had him running around a field. And I turned around and said, put him in a pool first offload those joints make him run the same amount of time but in water and I bet he wouldn't have given up so quickly so mm. but then change it to the other side you've got your lymphedema lipedema person who is equally told they're obese but isn't because they have this condition with the lymphatic system where they retain the fluid but their limbs are much more floaty OK, so you don't want them to be as deep in the water. So they're not offloading the joints because that's not the issue. But what they need to do is they need that same compression, but they need to be a little bit shallower. So you're going to want them sort of more at that chest depth. So whereas an obese person, you probably would go maybe chest to shoulder because you want as much of them submerged. You want as much um, metabolic sort of changes happening. You want them to be sort of challenged through all of their muscles you want them to sort of work against the resistance of the water we're going into turbulence and all the other properties there but with a person who has a medical condition of lipedema lymphedema you want them to be shallower you want that decompression on the joints but you want them to be able to be grounded so they can actually have a better quality of movement in a, an area that they can control so they can get that range of movement they can work on balance because quite often their balance isn't very good um, and that they can actually you know use the benefits of the hydrostatic pressure did that answer your question kate that was great that's super thanks linda i think there's just so much it's like we could all drain you dry you know like <laughs> frantically making notes thank you that was super. okay anybody else Silence was the reply. 
Hayley, anything you can think of? Anything that you think I need to to talk about? No, I mean the the you know going back to Kate's question, you know, again, it there's there's people's body shapes. They could be twenty stone, but they could be twenty stone of muscle and be a rugby player, or they could be twenty stone of um, fat and there's 20 stone but their bodies will act differently in the water yeah. and the one thing that I see a lot with my aqua customers is that because um, they're in water when you've got someone who's new shy body conscious because they're bigger they want to go deeper yeah and when they want to go deeper it's because the psychological factor of being covered and they want to be submerged so that they can't see their body. Well, they think we can't see their body, but we can see their body because, you know, it's water yeah. and we can see through it. I mean, it would be lovely if we could actually have um, sort of little groups with sp people with specific needs because we could target their exercises and their, their classes much more specifically. I mean, you know, in the perfect world. In yeah. a perfect build your own pool that only fits six people. And it's <laughs> <laughs> I asked my husband this week I'm, I'm like so missing the swimming pool and I said to him, and I was on my phone looking up those enormous swimming pools and I if said if you want to him, build one call me and I'll I'll talk you out of it <laughs> <laughs> well I said to him how, how do you feel if I just got one of those enormous Costco swimming pools and he went <laughs> you'd ruin the grass <laughs> we know where things have five years ago <laughs> I did it five years ago. I'm probably about, it, it was probably about a hundred grand or I put it on five credit cards. I oh just God. was just starting to get to the point to pay it off when COVID hit. Oh. Yeah. But, but I'm still open. I have, oh. I am an NH, I'm an NHS referral site and I'm still seeing patients. Uh, That's fantastic. That is really uh, good. Yeah. Private sessions. Yeah. Yeah with time in between for cleaning no it's actually more painful being open <laughs> <laughs> oh i don't know i miss it too much well saying uh, that though my, my clients have their own pools so i just go from pool to pool when i'm doing it. oh nice <laughs> yeah. yeah oh that's a good way to do it yeah <laughs> that helps I, i'm yeah. really considering the local fund at the end of my road <laughs> You've just got to convince him of your priorities, Hayley. <laughs> the ducks won't mind, will they? <laughs> yeah, the last after last week's rain, we could just go to the end of the road. It has been flooded <laughs> all around here. <laughs> oh dear. But still. Yes. Well, well I'm, I'm absolutely serious about that. If anybody is considering building, call me first. <laughs> <laughs> At so least learn all my mistakes. <laughs> that's the one thing i'd be more than happy to spend a couple of hours with you and hopefully let you learn from <laughs> excellent uh, we're all a, we're all a community here so we're happy to share and, and reach out to anyone so yeah lovely thank you all right guys well um don't want to take up too much more of your evening um and again apologies for the beginning of the um zoom call but we hope you've enjoyed it Leave a comment, give us a review. Also, also that the actual full version of the lecture will be available on our website um, once Haley's edited and things like that. But this is this is the first one that goes out. So the other one will be probably by the end of next week or something. But yeah, that's the full um, intro at the beginning of the yeah, full, No, the full physiology of immersion. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. is that? Um, Linda and Hayley is Maria here hi, Hello, hi. Um, is that is that charged is that is there a fee for that one if you're putting the full one up yes uh, full, yeah the full one will be yeah right okay lovely thank you that's brilliant yes. all right guys have a lovely evening it was lovely to see you all keep in touch and I hope to see you all soon on our next talk yeah. okay thank you thanks very bye. much guys bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.